Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for the profound part of the night. I asked Chris to give this part because I think that of all of the different stories of theory, this is what's gonna come together. I don't have closing remarks better than what Chris can say. Thank you for being here for this incredible evening, for this opportunity. And Chris, thank you for being so creepy. You're welcome, Lilia. People get sick a lot with Chris Carrico. Hello, people of Odd Salon. Let me just, uh, I am not as diminutive as some of our speakers tonight, unfortunately. It's cool, I got this. Oh, 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 I found the thing. We good? I think we're good. Okay, I'm gonna adjust the thing. I think we're good. My public needed me. Your public does need you, always. But mostly behind the scenes. Let's hear it for Steen. So, I framed my talk around a series of historical misadventures, you could call them shit shows, and uh, I kinda can't help feeling that Rebecca stole my thunder because nothing I have to say is gonna be as outright embarrassing and appalling as what she did. But it did kill more people and that has to count for something. It is, for the record, World Goth Day, which is why I am dressed as a fancy coffin and many of the rest of us are too. Because we never dress this way normally. Shh, you shut your mouth. So, earlier tonight we asked you if you'd ever been to Odd Salon before. I have a question. Have you ever been sick before? Raise your hands. I see people who are not raising their hands and fuck you people. There are some old things, okay, so theories, right? Theories are mental structures we have built on observations to explain something in the real world. They're, they're tools. And they've existed as long as we've had tools, which is actually longer than we've had people. Uh, animals and people have been getting sick since before there were people, and the amazing thing is they've been getting better again. But it's also been clear for basically that whole time that there are things you can do when you're sick to affect your chances of getting better soon and to affect your chances of getting sick again. People have had theories about this as long as they've had stories in general. And up until pretty recently, the state of the, the art on the, the science of illness was the miasma theory, which is that bad air makes you sick. And so that resulted in things like the plague doctors of the Black Plague, and, and here in Renaissance Italy in particular, where you'd wear this mask on your face to make you look like a spooky crow, which was awesome, that would be full of scented herbs. And the idea is that this would prevent the bad smells in the air from giving you bubonic plague and leaching all your bodily fluids under the cobblestone streets of central Italy. It kind of worked. So think about what a theory does. A theory takes input data and gives you output uh, prescriptions for things you could do. If you believe that bad air from things like rotting corpses, uh, other places where people get sick, get you sick, you'll do things like clean yourself regularly, maybe watch what you eat, avoid other sick people, and avoid pl places people get sick, which it turns out will do most of the things you can do to prevent you from getting sick. So it's actually a pretty good working model. And it, yes, it was the state in the art of observational science from Hippocrates in about, I think like, 300 BC in Greece, uh, to Galen in 200 AD, also Greek but during the Roman Empire period, to Paracelsus who invented toxicology in the 16th century in Europe. Bunch of dead white guys doing the best they could and they really hadn't progressed very far beyond this bad air hypothesis for a really long time. And the important reason for this is that as we now know, many of the things that actually get you sick are quite small. So if you want to see them, you need this, which is something like a steampunk convention meets a, a, a decorative glass blower's fair, um, which are early microscopes. And they look really fancy because all of them are made by hand with exacting precision by people who'd spent their whole lives learning this shit. And they weren't microbiologists. They were like, you know, optics makers and like, this is their life's work. 
And uh, so now that you finally had observational tools in the early 19th or, or late 18th century, you'd figure that would be able to see the things that caused diseases and be able to treat them better. And you'd be wrong. <laughs> I have a few anecdotes for you about why you'd be wrong. Ignaz Semmelweis, uh, another, another dead white guy, um, had a, a, a burning scientific question in the 1850s. Why do mothers die at about three times the rate in maternity wards and hospitals they do with midwives at home, given that they have the state-of-the-art medical facilities, lots of things are kept clean, they've chased those bad airs out, etc. And he did an observational study on maternity wards and hospitals and came up with a, a novel conclusion, which is that maybe it'll help if doctors who are doing lots of anatomy work to figure out how the human body works and you know, keep themselves fluent in that, start washing their hands after they do anatomy work on rotting corpses. <laughs> and he, he came up with this radical hypothesis that if you wash your hands with like a, a somewhat sterile solution of bleach after you shove them into a dead person's abdomen before you know, helping deliver a baby, um, that, that it would help. And uh, the medical community broadly rejected his work. So he started sending a series of increasingly angry open letters to everyone he could. Uh, he started drinking heavily, abandoned his wife and children, and exhibited increasingly inappropriate behavior, eventually getting committed to a mental institution where he got beaten by a guard and died of bacterial sepsis. Oh. Irony. Leaving the important take home message that how you say what you say is unfortunately at least as important for getting people to do it as actually whether you're right or not because they don't fucking know. In the same vein, London, uh, as, as one of the largest cities in Europe at this time and, and quite congested, had a recurring problem with cholera epidemics. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, cholera is a disease you get by eating, by, sorry, drinking contaminated water. Uh, that basically results in you shitting your guts out and dying of uh, dehydration. Very pleasant. And uh, a researcher named John Snow, <laughs> sorry, not that one, with an H, John Snow, but that really around the same age, um, did a, 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 a very important um, research project on cholera where he basically mapped the, uh, the, the, the current epidemic, and I believe it was 1854, to this one water pump in, in London. And they actually found that someone had dug a cesspit underneath their house, because of course all houses had just brick-lined cesspits at that point. It was about three feet away from the drinking well, and someone had uh, uh, put a, a cloth diaper into it from a baby that had cholera, which then had seeped in through these like shitty brick walls. And given everyone in the neighborhood this transmissible, horrible illness, which is causing all these fatalities. And so he published this, the, the, the um, well, we'll get to that. 1866, mysterious pause later, um, London finally got on board with this public health uh, uh, recommendation, and they said not to drink any water that came from, from a cholera area unless it had been boiled not to, to keep the, the boiled water overnight because then it might get recolonized and so on and so forth. Things that are now pretty standard practice in like developing nations, for example, that don't have the antibiotics to deal with cholera that we would like. Um, and I'm gonna return to this political cartoon. So London had a free and active press at this point and people got pretty upset about the London Water Board uh, uh, fixing this pump handle on the pump. Yeah, that's right. So after you have a cholera infected pump, on this well, clearly the problem is that the pump handle must have been infected somehow, and that if you swap the handle out, no one's gonna get sick anymore. Um, which is why the John Snow Memorial Society still uh, symbolically changes the handle on this pump every year to raise awareness of uh, <laughs> ongoing crises in public health. John Snow died in 18, I think, 59 at the age of 45 of a stroke while working at his desk. So he didn't actually live the remaining seven years to see his work validated by, in fact, a, a former rival of his. Um, but it did actually help public health in London. And so around the, the later 19th century, uh, Louis Pasteur, shown here, 
finally succeeded in getting widespread, widespread traction for germs as a causative agent of disease. And how did he do that? Well, he had a lot of scientific experiments that were are really important for this. Like, for example, if you take a, a basically soup broth, um, you boil it, kill everything in it, and you put it in a very long tubed glass device, you can show that unless some dust particle or something gets into the broth, it will remain sterile indefinitely. Thus proving that, that disease was caused by things you could kill. Spoilage was caused by things you could kill. And the practical application is extended into food production. But what really cemented his reputation was fancy silks. <laughs> so it turns out that France produced a large, large quantity of silk during this period. And they did this by culturing silkworms in basically a, a kind of like hand industrial process. And when silkworms get sick with this bac bacterial pathogen uh, shown here called uh, flasherie, um, they don't produce silk well, also they die. Uh, and so by allowing uh, people working for him to dissect these silkworms, he could pick out these bacteria under the microscope finally, see that they were there, put them in other uninfected silkworms and demonstrate that it would like make them sick in turn with the same disease. And by doing this, he basically, although they didn't have antibiotics yet, they, they allowed screening of silkworms and hygiene practices applied to the food they fed them and saved the French silk industry, thus generating a literal, not a literal, a metaphorical mountain of cash. <laughs> Around the same time, Robert Koch, um, working over in Germany, uh, discovered the bacteria responsible for tuberculosis using very similar approaches to what Pasteur was doing and came up with uh, uh, what are known as Koch's postulates to this day, four rules for determining whether something is a causative agent of disease. And from this, he came up with a drug called tuberculin, which is like heralded as this like miracle cure. You could give it to people and it would like basically work kind of like a vaccine to prevent tuberculosis from getting you as sick and allow you to clear the bacteria. And it was a total fucking failure. So, Robert Koch was a really good scientist. Louis Pasteur was a really good scientist. They both had like pretty good models based on observation for how this stuff worked. And uh, uh, Pasteur is perhaps more remembered than Koch because his stuff generally happened to work and Koch's didn't. Like the tuberculin was a total fucking failure. Although it's still used to help diagnose TB, it has no real ability to fix it. And this is like an important lesson. So your theory can be right to a point and also your follow-on theory that seems totally elementary after it can be wrong. However, uh, this idea finally demonstrated that germs could help cause disease, made massive inroads in the food industry uh, by making things safer to eat. This is a shot from, uh, uh, I think, 1939. Um, but by the late 20s, like, most food in the U.S. was pasteurized and people stopped getting sick all the time from drinking milk, for example. Uh, we also got antibacterials <laughs> of a variety of stripes, even down to soap, um, leading to a massive decrease in deaths from now treatable infections, uh, which led to things like asthma, which I suffered from as a small child, took inhaled steroids for years. And uh, it turns out when you don't give your immune system enough bacteria to defend against, one of the follow-on consequences of that is it gets kind of bored, like some sort of military industrial complex run amok and starts attacking everything nearby like your airways. So I have like lung scarring. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was going to show you photos of MRSA, but I want you to order more cocktails later and not like Ralph on the floor. Uh, so I encourage you to look them up on your own time, but I'm not going to here. Um, turns out also that the germ theory of disease had gone, if anything, too far, and that by framing all disease as a matter of microbes or viruses or what have you that were pathogenic agents you could treat, it left us kind of ill-prepared for things like cancer that are complex multicellular structures that are made out of us. Things like autoimmune diseases, neurodegeneration. Most of the things we really worry about and that scare us now are not directly caused by infectious agents. They're Oh gosh, if you want to go with the modern paradigm, errors in our programming. I know, I feel that way about it too. And, uh, and perhaps most importantly, even when we have a good theory that describes the disease in question, we still have to figure out 
how to apply it properly. So cholera, right? We've basically known how cholera gets transmitted for 150 years, maybe a little more, and still we're doing things like bringing a cholera epidemic to Haiti with peacekeeping troops. This was a solvable problem since before there was United Nations. We can do better. But you have to realize the theoretical tool you have is actually appropriate to the problem at hand. And you have to realize when it's not appropriate to the problem of hand, at hand too. So I'd like to leave you with a thought that I think is pretty important, which is that theories don't need to be perfect to be good enough, but you do need to be able to ditch them when they stop working. And I think we can all drink to that. <laughs>